Monster Hunter Wilds was just released, and over a million people beat Chotacabra to death in the release weekend non-stop. That's what I call getting in that Ava. <laughs> Of course, as a gamer, I'm excited about hunting new and old monsters. But as a paleontologist, Monster Hunter Wilds interests me for another reason. It's focus on ecology and biology and its world building. And since I'm a paleontologist, I'm of course in love with the sacreds. It's a dinosaur with a lot of bird-like characteristics that we get to use as our companion and mount. <laughs> I'd like to be your sacred, if you know what I mean. <laughs> Get it? Because mounting, mount, you know, it's, it's your mount. <laughs> anyway, the sacred has beaks, wings, and feathers just like Pen Pen here. And it's all I've ever wanted in dinosaur representation. Also, they're so beautiful. Like, even their babies are just so fluffy and huggable. I'm Raisuka, the cosplaying paleontologist, and today I'm going to tell you all about the paleontology that inspired the sacreds in Monster Hunter Wilds and how they revealed the secrets of how dinosaurs evolved into birds, which are living dinosaurs. You see what I did there? <laughs> Do you get it? Uh -huh. And lucky for you, studying how dinosaurs evolved into birds, which again are living dinosaurs, is my specialty as a paleontologist. But before we go any further, make sure you hit like and subscribe and hit that bell notification button so you don't miss out on the latest dinosaur science and news from the coolest paleontologist on the internet. <laughs> Now, sacreds are the means of transportation of the Kanafa, the village that lives in the Windward Plains Desert. They're strong enough to carry people, but they're also fast and agile enough to move efficiently across different terrain. And all of these characteristics line up with one of the main current hypotheses on how theropod dinosaurs became flying birds. Today, it's widely accepted that most small to mid-sized theropod dinosaurs were feathered to some degree, but there are some lineages inside that clade that are widely accepted as having been completely covered in feathers. One of these fully feathered groups are the Dromaeosaurs, the group that includes famous raptor-like dinosaurs like Velociraptor and Utahraptor. They're even more famous than me. <laughs> Now these dinosaurs would have been covered in feathers in a way that's really similar to the way that the sacreds of Monster Hunter have. A fluffy all over short feather covering, a tail with long feathers that splay out into a fan shape and that are angled towards the ground, long flight feathers along their arms that were wing-like, and longer feathers along the top crest of their head. Now I'll remind you that while dromaeosaurs did have feathers that look like those of modern birds, they were not birds and they were not capable of flying. Poor Pen Pen, he can't fly either, but it's okay. <laughs> the closest thing to a flying dromaeosaur that we know about is the minuscule microraptor that could glide between trees, but they definitely could not fly. So why did raptors have wings if they couldn't even fly? Well, they may have had them for the exact same reason that the sacreds have them. Maneuverability. <laughs> Maneuverability, if you know what I mean. Hold on, I'm just making sure my nipple's not out, okay? No peeking. Now having aerodynamic wings and a tail was not enough for these dinosaurs to take to the air, but flapping their wings could help them to climb ramps and short heights more easily in uneven terrain. Their aerodynamic wings and tail could also allow them to make sharper turns, which would be very advantageous while hunting or running away from larger predators. Over time, these aerodynamic feathers could have become so effective for speed in navigating uneven terrain that dromaeosaurs with aerodynamic feathers became much more likely to survive, and thus their feathers kept being evolutionary selected for over many, many generations of raptors. At some point in the dinosaur to bird evolutionary trajectory, their wings and additional feathers were enough to help the dinosaur run over a 90 degree ramp, which would be strong enough force to effectively allow the animal to fly. Like, please, I'm a star! But it's like, please, I can fly! Sometimes I hear Pen Pen saying that in sleep, but don't tell him I told you guys. Nothing pen pen. So the ancestors of living birds would have had running habits exactly like those of the sacred. Pretty cool, huh? However, there is something very wrong in the way that the sacreds run. You're not getting off that easy. Even if you are good representation of dinosaurs in the media, the cosplaying paleontologist 
for no one. When the Sacreds go full speed, they assume a four-legged stance like a dog. This would cancel out all of the advantages of the aerodynamic wings and feathers while they're running and would be physically impossible for theropods to do. If you try to rotate your wrist to put your palm toward the ground, notice that it's not your wrist bones that are rotating, but your shoulder. Having a shoulder that can rotate is one of the reasons that us humans are identified as primates. Because rotating your shoulder is something that no other group of animals besides primates can do, including dinosaurs. I don't care what Jurassic World says about the D-Rex, only primates can rotate their shoulders. I can think of a fun activity for us that involves a lot of shoulder rotating. <laughs> so anyway, the only way that theropod dinosaurs could supinate their wrist to a two-legged stance while they're walking and then pronate their wrist to a four-legged stance while running is if they dislocated their shoulders every single time they switched stances. And that would hurt a lot. And it would also really tank your chances of survivability in the Mesozoic. That hurt my knee. <laughs> You make me weak in the knees, baby. Us paleontologists are actually known for having pretty beat up knees because when you're in the field, you're on your knees all the time, searching for tiny little bones on our knees all the time. A good tip to save your knees in the field is to make sure you wear big knee pads. That'll at least help for a few years. Back to the Sacrets and Monster Hunter Wilds. <laughs> Even if the stance switch up in the Sacrets is super unlikely, a dinosaur in the media with super native wrists is still a great improvement compared to how dinosaurs were portrayed earlier in this series. So good job Capcom, you didn't do like Jurassic World did and you actually learned from your mistakes. Okay? And you're awesome. And I love the Sacrets. I love the secrets go secrets <laughs> sorry i'm having an internal anxiety attack for a second and i have to take a moment okay we're calm we're collected we're in commander mode commander mode get in the ava most of the bird and brute wyverns would lean more towards the dinosaur side and they had pronated wrists until very recently which again is a position where the hands are facing the ground in highly scientific, technical terms, we call these bunny hands. And that's how I defended my PhD. <sighs> now the first creature I can remember in Monster Hunter that had the correct hand positions is the Kuluyaku from 5th Gen that had hands that were well suited for grabbing things. I really want to make a video about Kulu on its own at some point too, because I could talk for a while about how it has a lot of cool features speculating on dinosaur intelligence and tool usage. So like and subscribe and comment and stuff and all that sh if you want that video. You better get in the Ava, you better subscribe, you better comment, you better like, you better hit the bell notification! Now, the way that the Sacreds use their feathers could also allude to other hypotheses about how dinosaurs developed flight. The first origin of flight hypothesis that I already described in this video is called the bottom-up hypothesis, where birds developed flight from running and jumping upward to achieve flight from the ground. But another competing possibility is that birds took a top-down approach to flight evolution. Now imagine a dinosaur just like the Sacred that was much smaller and good at gliding between short distances, like say between two trees for example. This would allow it to more easily access food and get away from predators. And over time, these surviving animals could evolve to be better climbers and gliders. Over millions of years, reduction of weight in their skeleton and body makeup, along with more adaptations for climbing and gliding, may evolve that would result in powered flight as an option, which would really benefit this animal that would be already adapted to gliding between trees. Now, the reason that these two competing theories for the origin of flight exist, we really lack the fossils and the data necessary to confirm whether one was more likely than the other. Again, my field of research specializes on focusing how dinosaurs evolved into living birds. So of course the origin of flight is a question that I'm especially interested in. I'm trying to figure it out by analyzing extinct and living birds alongside extinct dinosaurs that were almost birds but not quite there yet. Just like the dromaeosaurs and the sacreds that we're talking about today. If sacreds were real, I would totally be studying them guys. So just wait 
wait a little bit longer for me, baby, and I'll make a video on this channel when I find out more. By the way, you should like and subscribe so you don't miss out when I publish groundbreaking paleontology research and a study about the origin of flight and break it down to you. Get in the Ava. But we're not done yet, so just last a little longer for me, okay? <laughs> Good boy. There's another very interesting transitional characteristics between non-avian dinosaurs and birds that we can see in the sacred. They have both teeth and a beak. <laughs> now, from the fossil record in real life, we know that there are dinosaurs with a lot of bird-like characteristics, but no beak like the Archaeopteryx that existed. It had a snout and not a beak. And we know that there were extinct ancestral birds with beaks but without teeth that existed. Very few animals had both a beak and teeth. Now, living birds do not have teeth at all, and currently we only know about three extinct birds slash bird-like dinosaur ancestral creatures that had both a beak and true teeth. And those are Longiptrix shionensis from the early Cretaceous period, around 120 million years ago. And then Ichthyornis and the Hesperornithiforms, which were from around the KPG boundary when Mesozoic dinosaurs went extinct. Now Longiptrix has a pretty long beak, and then it only has teeth at the very tip of its beak. And the current hypothesis is that it probably ate things like insects or fruit, but Hesperornis and Ichthyornis were more like the Sacrets, where they had a beak that was pretty much full of teeth except for the tip of their beak. So because of this, I would think that the Sacrets are more closely related to ancestral birds like Hesperornis and Ichthyornis than they are to theropod dinosaurs because they have a beak full of real teeth. Uh, yeah, did you guys ever watch like Ryan's Sacrets growing up? Now that being said, the adult Sacrets are like Ichthyornis and Hesperornis, like I said, where their beak is pretty much filled with teeth except that the tip of the beak doesn't have any teeth. So the adult has no teeth on the premaxilla, and then it has no teeth on the symphysis of the mandible or the jaw. But the chicks have beaks with no lips that are totally lined with teeth, even along the tips of their mandible and maxilla. Now in this way, the sacred really reminds me of this weird theropod dinosaur called Limusaurus in extracabalus. Now they don't have a beak, they have a snout because they're a theropod dinosaur, but they're born with a mouthful of teeth as a chick. So Limusaurus babies are born with a jaw full of teeth. They don't have a beak, they just have a snout full of teeth because they're a theropod dinosaur. But as they became adults, they would actually lose all of their teeth and their snout now it became a beak. That's so f cool! This change in Limusaurus is driven by dietary change as it ages. It's an omnivore during its younger stages and then it slowly progresses to a more herbivorous lifestyle as it reaches adulthood. Now remember the sacred goes through the reverse process. The chicks have a beak shape that's similar to the extinct herbivorous bird diatrima. Its beak is tall and almost conical or cone shaped and it doesn't have the hook at the tip of the beak that's present in the adult sacred. So when you combine their beak shape with the teeth, Teeth present in their beak. Sacred babies would probably have a more omnivorous diet that could include grazing on ground level vegetation and eating seeds and small animals. As the sacrets age, they lose their teeth at the tip of their beak, but their teeth grow longer and sharper. This is exactly the configuration of the teeth and beak that's present in Ichthyornis and Hesperornis. Largely ate fish. Only thing that's different is the large hook at the tip of the beak in the adult sacred. This hook at the tip of the beak is really only seen in extreme extinct carnivorous terror birds and in birds of prey like eagles, hawks, and owls. So whether it's fish or other prey in general, based on these characteristics, I think it's safe to say that as the sacrets grow up, they become much more reliant on meat if not entirely so. Snouty teeth to beak transition is a really important and fascinating evolutionary question that paleontologists like me are still investigating. And it is a really cool feature to see portrayed in the media. Again, great job Capcom, great job. Now that you know more about your trusty companion, it's time to go hunting. Do you need a mount baby? Cause I'm available. It'll be our dirty little sacred. <laughs> like and subscribe for that plate drop on your next hunt.